Well, we Hello there. Can you hear me? Is it working? Brilliant. Hello. Is it okay if I speak in English? My, I can speak a bit of Dutch, but that probably doesn't help, does it? Um, okay. So I'm not going to use many buzzwords, if that's okay. So I'm not going to talk about agile or DevOps or all these other things. Blockchain. What's that? Um, I'm going to talk about, I think, uh, I think more important, really, a, a social problem we have, right? Because I, well, I don't really anymore, but I used to go to parties. How many of you go to parties? Um, a few of you, that's good. Well, can you invite me next time? Um, and it's, 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 common, it's a common problem for programmers, like I've got the T-shirt. Um, you go to a party and you ask people, uh, hi, how are you doing? What's your name? They tell you what you do. It's something interesting. And they ask you what you do. And you say, programmer. And they run away. And they don't talk to you anymore because they're not interested. They don't know how to talk to you. They don't know how to engage with you. They don't know how to actually start a conversation. They're actually not, they're not interested often. And this is a problem, obviously for me at parties, but I think it's a social problem in a, in a larger perspective because there's so many exciting and important things in programming to be discussed as a world. And wha wha what does that even mean? Well. Let's just imagine if we just uh, did the same but with reading and writing. You know, you say, what's your name? I say, I'm Sam, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a writer. Ooh, what do you write? For magazines, poems, rap lyrics? Like there's a whole plethora of things you could talk about as a writer to be ex explored and discussed. And because we all understand reading and writing a little bit, perhaps, maybe a lot for in some cases, we can actually start to have that conversation and explore more of that person's world. But with programming, we don't have that opportunity. I think this is a problem that we need to solve. Uh, and I think it's more of an important problem than, than figuring out what the latest technologies are. And actually, interestingly, there's a lot of interesting technologies in attempting to solve this, as we'll discuss. Because uh, finding ways to engage people is, is not an easy a a a a endeavor to do. And also making sure that the things we do that, uh, that we've created are actually approachable and accessible is also extremely hard. We can all make new technologies, but can we make technologies simple? That's a really hard problem. Um, and often, the working technology, from a business perspective, that's all you care about. It works. We can make some money out of this. We can, our product is successful or not successful, but it's this <laughs> we've passed the test that the technology works. But if it's not simple, it's much harder to maintain, it's much harder to reason about, it's much harder to pass on from engineer to engineer or developer to developer or for the business even to actually read this thing and understand it. And from an education perspective, if it's not simple, it's completely dead in the water. So actually, I think education is a really interesting place to explore the simplification of technologies. And it's also a really exciting place to explore the, uh, the way to actually approach it and to engage a broader audience. And, as we'll discover in a moment, there's some really deep computer science questions to ask when we take computer science into other places than business. Now, what other places could we be? Well, I'm actually interested in taking computer science and technology onto a musical platform. I want to go into large music festivals and use technology on stage, and I do. Right, so three years ago, I performed at Moogfest America, and I got into the Rolling Stone magazine, where they talked about code as an instrument. Right, so this is a real thing. Next year, I'm going to play at the Royal Albert Hall in London using code, right, with thousands of kids singing and violin players and traditional forms of making music, but code as another way of doing this. And this software I'm going to show you, there's, it's entirely free, it's entirely open source, but there was, we had a million people use this thing. So it's really exciting to see uh, a, a new attitude and a new approach to, to engaging with software. So what is this thing? It's, it's a software called Sonic Pi. I can show you some uh, information about it. Here we are. Um, I designed and developed it at University of Cambridge. You can follow the Twitter accounts. Um, we have some fabulous people who have worked on the software. It's got documentation built in, so there's a whole book in there. And it translates to multiple languages, including Swedish. Um, and we've got lots of options in there. Well, that's, that's, that's great. But what do we do? We, we write code, right? That's why as programmers. And we run the code and we make a mistake, right? And this is actually a really important thing to talk about when you're engaging with anyone who's a non programmer that the common position for programming is a mistake, right? We're always in an error position. Because if we're not in an error position, we're on to the next error position, right? We're always in an error state. And this, this fallacy that programmers are always producing correct code is obviously something we need to break immediately. 
we're always having a discussion with the computer and it's always in the error state. And we're using the error state to actually get more information out and to actually work and, and go further. So the first correct piece of code you can write in Sonic Pi is the word play, because we're going to have some fun, choose a number and run the code and make a beep. Right, this is fun. So you can do this at home. You can download this for free. You can write the word play and you don't have to use the word number 60. You can choose 65 for higher notes and 50 for a low note. And you can go as low as you can go. Not much bass in this room. Um, if it was, I, I did this talk in a cinema in the Netherlands. And you can imagine the bass in the cinema and the people in their comfy seats like this. <laughs> so yes, yeah, you can get some good, good bass. You could also start to test like the ability of the human here to perceive sound. This is obviously too high to hear, and this is too low to hear. So we have a range of possible audio. Um, and this is fun. Like my f I, f I saw on Twitter a, a couple of years ago, this guy was saying, I'm having a lot of fun with Sonic Pi. I'm just writing one line of code, and I'm just annoying the hell out of my dog with really high-pitched noises. So he was like doing something like this, and he couldn't hear what the dog was like, oh, this is annoying. Right, and you could test your granny's hearing air, uh, levels and, and if you go to have a hearing test, they're using beeps like this, right? So, but the fun thing is here, we can literally play any note. We can even play fractions of notes in between. So this is like in between two notes on a piano. We have the full range of all possible notes with one line of code. And then with two lines of code, we can make two notes. In this case, it's a chord, so they're both playing at the same time. Now, this is, this is maybe as interesting. How many of you are programmers in this room? A few, most of you, brilliant, right, okay. So this might surprise you, might not surprise you. I mean, in the early days, uh, this used to be like play line one, then line two, but it was a demonstration of how fast c computers are. So although it is doing it sequentially, it's doing it so quickly, we can't perceive the difference. It's not like it's doing ding, ding, it's, it's like a chord. Although I have re-implemented this to actually play them exactly sample accurately at the same time. We'll talk about time quite a bit. Um, but really, when you're talking about music, time is really the most important construct. And to get that to work and to work accurately is really essential. Um, and so we can see at the right hand side here, at time zero, I did actually play both of those notes. Um, so if I want to make a melody, I need one more command, and that's sleep. And now I have the ability to make any melody in the world we've ever heard and ever will hear. What does that mean? Well, if you look at most of Western music, we have those lines and dots. Right, and they represent which note to play and when to play it, basically. There's all the bits of other stuff like with expression or which instrument to use or the duration of the note. But in its essence, a melody is just which note to play and when to play it. And we have those two commands here. Now this is important because children can do this already. You can do this already without any more instruction. You just need to figure out which notes you like. There's no correct, there's no incorrect. There's just the ones you like, ones you don't like. You choose the right timings between the notes and you can make whatever melody you want. And you can reproduce any melody you've heard before. And this is important because children can do this too. And so we already, without, without having much complexity, we've got something which actually is hugely expressive. Now this shouldn't be a surprise. Because six in the 60s, Seymour Papert and friends created Logo to teach children how to code. And they had a few commands. It was pen down, pen up, rotate, and forward. And with those commands, you can draw any picture, which is great because kids did. Right? And that's how they engaged children in the 60s and 70s. They were actually way ahead in many ways than we are today with teaching children how to code. And it's quite depressing that we haven't taken their knowledge and their learnings and have it evolve and apply to, to the modern day. We, we're still, in many ways, catching up. Um, but here we go. We have the musical equivalent of this. And the interesting point for me is that uh, I've really just started this talk and I've already got to the point where we're at most of Western music. Right? And this is important. Because when we're programming, when we're doing technology, we're really talking about the potential and what we can do. And having a starting point like this is, is, should be exciting. It's like, OK, we can do this. What else can we do? Right? And we start to actually use our imaginations to think about how we can code a system like this upwards into more interesting places. Because as I said before, I program at music festivals. I'm going to perform in a festival in Estonia in July in Ireland. I'm not going to do this. Right, beep, boop, 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 boop. You're not, it's not going to work, is it really? Um, so how do I take this into an interesting place? Well, let's have a look at other things you can do. So one thing you can do is uh, you can change, if I play 60 like this, I can change how long the note takes to warm up. So the attack time, so fade in time. Oh, there we are. Or I can fade in, or I can uh, release over zero. 
cut off quickly, so I can change the, the, the sort of the duration of the note and its amplitude. And if I look at the documentation, I can actually see that there's some information about what this means. So I can go from quiet to loud and fade out, or I can fade in over different times. So I can control the sound duration in all these crazy complicated ways. But actually, release is all you care about, typically, having a short release or a long release. Right? And then I can also change the sound. So if I use synth, I can change the sound to side note profit. And I can play. Oh, that doesn't sound so good. So maybe if I do some maths in here, if I drop it by 12, or maybe 24, 36, and use a low pass filter. Oh, that's actually called cutoff these days. And maybe change the release time to 8, amplitude to 5. Well, I've taken it from the symbol beep to something much more interesting, right? And all I'm doing is tinkering and changing some values. And, I'm, and I, my promise to you is that everything I'm doing today, I can explain to a 10-year-old child. And this is really important. So I'm bringing up the ominously there. Look, all I'm doing is changing a number. And this is something that you can do and children can do. And this is a way to engage people and say, actually, programming is more than just business apps. Right? It's something it's, it's a tool for us to express ourselves with. And we can express ourselves. If you want, if your form of expression is to build a business app, then go for it. Right? If that excites you and makes you get up in the morning, and my, and today my life is going to be building a business app, fine. But I think there's many other things we can do with programming in addition to that. And I think music is only one of many different things. And so here we're just manipulating an interesting synthesizer with code and just changing the timbre. Now, what might be interesting to you, if you're a programmer, is to hear actually those little sounds are layering on top of each other, right? So already in a multi-threaded system, right? We are each every time the screen goes pink, we're creating a thread inside the system, and they're running concurrently. So we're teaching kids concurrent programming already. Now, the tough thing about because con concurrency is dead easy, right? You've got multiple things going on at the same time. Anyone can understand that. Juggling three balls, juggling five balls, juggling a hundred balls. The hard part is the state manipulation. Hard part is coordinating state across the threads. We're not doing any coordination here. So the kids, it's not a problem. And, and we'll get into that at the moment, actually, about the concurrency, because children want it, weirdly. I didn't expect that. But here we are. We can actually work with concurrent programming by just layering on sounds on top of each other. But another thing that kids want to do all the time is not just play sounds like this, but play pre-recorded sounds, any sound that they've found off the internet or sound they recorded with their phones, and use that to make the music. So, for example, I can uh, take this sound here like this. Crazy sounds, make it a bit louder. But I can also do things like change its rate. Right, that's stretching it out, making it sound lower. And again, I'm just layering those sounds on top of each other. Um, we can take any pre-recorded sound. So let's look at this Amen break. It's the famous drum break, uh, which was recorded. Uh, let's actually let's just do it amplitude three in the 60s. Uh, but it was put on a sampler, free sampler CD given to, to producers, music producers in the 80s. And so the hip hop producers uh, uh, started to take these kinds of samples and work with them for their rap lyrics. And one thing that NWA did, so Dr. Dre took the same sample and played it half speed and wrapped on top, right? So the kids can do this. Um, but then in Bristol, we were taking the same sound and a bit faster. And then about five years, eight, eight years later in London, there was this sort of jungle music, right? It's the same sample, just di different rates. But one thing that the kids, uh, uh, well, not the kids, in the early days, uh, people did all the time was take the sample and meticulously cut and paste all the different drum hits. Right, so they would actually use a, a, a program, take all the individual drum hits, then rearrange them manually. And it actually, it, earlier than that, they used to take actual physical tape and cut it with scissors and use sellotape to, to actually stick them back together to make new kinds of pieces of music. And so wouldn't it be great if we could if we get kids to do this kind of thing? I think it'd be quite expressive. And so could we do the same kind of with thing with this? Now, the problem is that audio files are just a big blob of data. They essentially represent in time where the speaker needs to be. Really, it's not the right abstraction for this. It's just, in fact, it's actually the microphone moved in and out when the actual original drummer hit his drums, uh, and those numbers have been preserved, and this sample is just a list of numbers which represented where the microphone was in time 
at the point where the person played the drums. And all we need to do is translate those numbers back into the uh, movements of the speaker system by changing the numbers into uh, electronic uh, pulses, which then move the magnets. We can reproduce the sound. But all that's too low level. Like Kids don't want to know about that. They just want to be able to say, I want to be able to play the first drum, and the second drum, and the third drum. We count from zero in programming, don't we? It's crazy. And so this does automatic feature detection on the audio file and presents a way for kids to actually just use it like an array, like a list of drum hits. So now I can create a loop and play the same drum lots of times, right? But it's much more fun to use a bit of randomization. We're already getting somewhere interesting, right? Three lines of code. Well, actually, it's four lines of code. One of them is the word end. doesn't really count. Um, and this is the thing is, ten year old everything I'm showing you today, ten year old children can do and, and do do. Uh, and so if it looks complicated, it's just different. And that's a really important thing with technology. Is that there's a big difference between things which are actually complicated and things which are just some things you haven't seen before. We may, which may in turn be complicated, but may actually be simple. They're just unknown and unfamiliar. And it's really important to separate those two and not get uh, uh, bogged down by, <gasps> I don't understand this, therefore it must be complicated. It's just different. Um, and the, the world of music and synthesis is just different. People ask me all the time, you must have been a really good musician to make music with code. So well, I ask people, what, what industry do you work in? They say, well, the pharmaceutical industry. Oh, you must have been really good with chemistry to code that industry. No. No, I just learned it on the job. And that every job you do, you understand about the business, which is pr what's programmable, what's not programmable. You don't necessarily need to be an expert in that domain. You can learn on that domain in the job. And music is exactly the same. Um, but then kids would also do this. So let's just comment this out. So if I run this, nothing happens. It's commented. So do another loop. Let's get a kick drum going. Right, so we're good. This is a nice kick drum, yep. Yeah. So we want to have that kick drum. Maybe it's too quiet, so a bit louder. All right, that's good. So then uh, let's get this this code here. Oh, I'm messing around with it too much. Right, let's get them both playing at the same time, right? So we've got two loops going. Oh, that's unfortunate. Hopefully the programmers in the room can see exactly why this isn't working. Um, but uh, maybe you need to be an expert to understand why this isn't working. Um, I mean, obviously, the problem is the fact that loops are like black holes. They suck in the programming context and keep it in there forever. Right? So the program, well, line one and line two are blank, so it skips those. Line three says loop. So we're looping between line three and line six forever. We never get to line seven or line eight or, or beyond. We're always in uh, lines three to six. So this is, in this is useful as a, as a teaching construct so that the, the kids say, Sir, sir, miss, miss, I, I don't know how to play the drums at the same time as the bass drum. You know, and you say, oh, that's because you're doing loops. And they say, okay, well, so how do I do this? And so you go to the teacher and you say, well, I've looked at the new curriculum, uh, UK curriculum for computer science, and it doesn't really have threads. So I can't really, how, how are we going to teach this? Because the, all, and, and the thing is, every workshop I do, within two hours, children want this. This is not like a, the one random kid who's just exploring. They, they all want to play the drums at the same time as the bass, or the guitar at the same time as the vocals. Or they want every band normally has more than one member, right? And so they want to do this. It's a natural thing. And so <laughs> the depressing thing is, the teacher says, uh, so you can't. It's not on the curriculum, right? And, and so the answer to that is to go to the kids and say, sorry, you've got to wait till the university. And it's a 10-year-old kid. And they've got to wait for eight years before they can play the drums at the time of the bass. Now, to me, this is a fundamentally uh, frustrating and depressing situation. Because most of the time, you haven't got kids asking, how do I program this? The fact we have some kids asking, how do I do this interesting programming technique, is amazing in itself. And that should be taken and held and caressed and stroked and looked after and grown and, and turned into something that's, uh, that's, that, that is much more than that starting seed. This is a seed that really could grow into something exciting. And by saying, wait till university, you're essentially not watering that seed. You're not giving any fertilization, you're just letting it just wither and die. And that's tragic. If you have the opportunity to answer that child's question, we should be able to. 
And so this is why, as programmers, we have this fabulous opportunity to use our skills to cheat. Right? That's what we do as programming. We always cheat. We're always building new techniques, new ideas, new ways of, of outmaneuvering the, the competition. That's cheating, really. It's like, oh, we've got a better technology than you. Oh, that's not fair. It's like a runner saying, well, I've got you. You've got better shoes. They make me leap 10 meters, right? Obviously, you can't do that in racing, but we can do that in business in many ways. And so I've created this new kind of loop called a live loop. And live loops need to have names. This is Kate playing the drums. This is Fred playing the, the Amen break. So we have to give them names because they're like band members. And once we give them names, we've got live loops, then we have... We've got concurrency built in, right? Which is nice. So we already have the ability to answer the question. We basically say, in Sonic Pi, the loop construct is called live loop. Right, the loop thing doesn't exist. I've just shown you that just because it was a good way of exp introducing it. But the way to do loops in, in classrooms is to do this. And they've got nice names, because that's nice and friendly. Okay? But in addition to this, I, I started by saying I perform at music festivals. Now, so far, every time I've made a modification of the sound, I've stopped it. Right, just imagine this as a performance, right? So we've got this going. Right, okay, I'm going to change the drums, everyone. Right, hold on, sorry. I'm just going to change the drums. Um, change this to maybe the list of that. Right, right, carry on dancing. Oh, hold on, I'm just gonna, um, let me just change this. Like, it's not going to work, is it, right? You can't stop and start, stop and start. But this is typical of normal programmers. Like we normally stop and start. Every time we modify the code, we tear the whole system down, all the databases, all of the, all the things, we w all the network connections. We recompile or reinterpret, rerun the code, rerun the tests, see what the results are, and then just keep doing that cycle. So we, we tear it down, bring it up, tear it down, bring it up. That's fine for a development perspective, although it does introduce huge delays, especially those compilation times that are seconds, you know, or minutes, or hours in some cases, or days in some cases. Uh, but that limits your ability to express yourself. Now, you, often you want to be in scenarios where you're in a, in a bit. Like I've, I've worked in an industry where I've had a client come in and they've asked questions. I'm like, tuk, 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 tuk. well, how about this? And they say, oh, no, not that at all. But that's good, right? Okay, well, not that. Okay, tuk, 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 tuk. oh, that's more like it. Tuk, 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 tuk. You want to be able to have a conversation where the, the, the business person can ask questions and you can actually facilitate those answers in the moment, not a day later. Not an hour later, but in that conversation, because you're therefore able to explore much wider spaces quickly. And you're able to ask questions which are stupid, because actually, the crazy questions may not yield good results, but the results they yield themselves may then ask more interesting questions. Right? So it's not just about asking the best questions, it's about asking questions which could eventually yield to interesting places, and often they're the ones that surprise you. Right, so by being able to ask more risky questions, more, more non-safe uh, questions, and knowing that the t time to result is moments, not days, well, that's actually not risky at all, is it? And so it's much more fun to have a conversation like this and much more potentially rewarding. And obviously, when we're making music, we want to be able to do this. So wouldn't it be cool if I could just comment things out and just move the code around? So whilst the code is still running, modify it. Now, there's a few things interesting going on there. We've got the concurrency thing, so multiple loops are playing at the same time. Um, I'm able to modify the loops as they're executing, but also notice that nothing lost time. So time was preserved across all those threads. So they're not just concurrent, they're working at the same time. Now, this is, this is now into a point where children, not only can they make any melody within two commands, they can play any pre-recorded sound with one command, they can loop those things with three lines of code, well, four, because the one's the word end. Um, they can also start to take those sounds and use them as arrays to work in with them, and then they can start to then, with simple constructs like this, modify the code as it's running. So we're teaching them that code isn't just something that we, we can write, it's, a, it's a obviously a very formal language, but if we get the right kind of approach, that right, right kind of simplicity, now, and it's really important to stress as well that this, this thing here has taken me a long time to come up with. Right? It's a simple thing, and I'm very pleased with it, and it's great. 
And obviously, everyone can go and copy it now, and, and it's, it's there in the world, and that's brilliant. But it's taken me many years of walking around in fields, thinking about how can I make this simple. Now, the, the technology I'm showing you, I had in a very much more complicated piece of software called Overtone, which was written in Clojure, many years ago. And I was able to use it myself, but nobody else could. And this was a problem. So people would come to my gigs and say, love the music, how do I do this? I'm really sorry, it's really complicated. There was never a good answer. Um, and so figuring out how to take that technology I already had and turn it into something that I could teach to a 10-year-old child has taken a long time. But it's been really, really worth it. And it surprised me in many ways, because I thought this, this system I'm showing you here would be the toy system I would teach to kids. And then this other system, which I'm not even talking about, right? And why am I not talking about it? Because it's not interesting anymore. Um, would be the tool that I would be using as a professional live coder. And then maybe you would transition to the, to the professional system if you reached the limitations of this basic system. Now, it turned out that by focusing on simplicity, and that was requirement for education, uh, it made a really beautiful performance system. Because when I'm performing on stage, like this is not really performance. I'm not really doing anything complicated now. Later on at 5 o'clock, you'll see me do much more interesting things. The, the, the stress levels are nuts. Right? The, amount of, uh, 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 the amount of time you have right, is, is nothing. Because breathing in takes too much time. It's like, I need to be able to do something now. Uh, and so if you've suddenly got to open Emacs and then connect to browsers over uh, network protocols, and then there's just too many things to think about. And then you've got to do a recursive function definition, which is going to... It's just too much to think about. If you're on your own and you've got a half an hour, Sure, you can just spend time and just gently and uh, nicely work on it. When it's tough, just calm down. As, you, as a programmer, work on it. But when you're in a performance situation, you do not have that space. And so a simple system is beautiful for performances, especially if you had a few beers. Right? It totally helps. Um, and th and but that, that's exactly this. It's the it's, it's really is the problem. And it's the same in education. If you've got a simple system, even if the teacher isn't a, 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 a hardcore live coder, he or she can actually look at the system, because it's simple, figure out the problem fairly quickly. And that's really, really important. So where else could we go with this? So um, I don't know how much time I've got left. Is it another five minutes? Perfect. Um, I mean, actually, at this point, maybe some questions would be useful, because I can just take it in the direction you want. Or I can just carry on talking. Any questions at this point? No. Yes? Am I paid to work on this? That's a very good question. Um, I, I have been. Um, so uh, it was initially funded by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. They were exceptionally kind to fund me for, for a number of years. Uh, and this software is installed by default on the Raspberry Pis. So I'm trying to lower the barrier to entry for a creative experience of code. And so one of those barriers to entry is, is complicated technology, so I made it simple. Another barrier to entry is documentation, so it's fully documented and it's translated to many languages. Another barrier to entry is cost, so this is an entirely free system, it's open source. But then there's also the cost of hardware. If I say, well, actually, you need a very expensive MacBook Pro, that's not really a, a, a good answer to lowering the barrier to entry. And so this runs on a Raspberry Pi. So it runs on a 35 euro computer. Um, but the Raspberry Pi Foundation have, have since moved on to different directions, and I'm out, out of funds. So I'm figuring out this problem now. So um, I've got this Patreon account. The problem is, right, is that I could charge money for this. But then, then Finland wouldn't have sent a bus to Africa to teach 2,000 women how to code with it. You know? And that's really important. And I, and I don't believe in making money for myself. I believe in making the world a better place. I know that probably makes me look a bit silly in this context here with the business people. But I really fundamentally believe in that. So I've got this dilemma of how do I continue to work on this whilst also being able to feed my children. So I don't know, if anyone has any ideas, uh, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, but Patreon or donations are, are the currently the best way to do this. Um, and we'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. Yes, any more questions? No? Shall I, shall I just show you in five more minutes what you can do with this? So uh, let's think about this. Where can we go with this now? So we've got the live loops, we've got the bass drums, got the guitars. And a few other things to do show you is that um, I can't really show you because it'll cause all really horrible feedback. But if I have an audio card, connect to my computer with a guitar plugged in, or a microphone plugged in, or a synthesizer plugged in, which you'll see later on. I just write this one line of code, and call it Sam in this case. If I run the code, whatever's plugged into my, my computer is now th coming through the speakers. So I have an instant way to actually plug in external instruments. Well, that's not that good, but what about this, where I can sort of say, I want to play my voice through reverb, or I want to play my voice through reverb and distortion. And so I can, 
I can nest and, and layer these things together. Now, what does that even mean? Well, imagine my voice was the ambi choir voice. Well, if I crushed it. So you can start to see that I can whatever sound goes in this do end block, I can add effects to it. I can layer them as many as I want. So I can take that sound, I can, I can change it to rate 0.25. Make some really crazy sound. So I can start to lay these things out. I, I have a really nice thing where I work with a guitarist, and he's playing his guitar, and I'm doing all this nonsense to it and completely destroying his sound, and then bringing it back to normal again, and I can record it into buffers and create loopers with it so I can start looping his own sound back at him. I can take his own guitar playing, slice it up like a slice the arm, arm end break, and reorder it and throw it back to him in different orders, and he's like, what's this? So there's lots of opportunity to do different things with real instruments, not just coded instruments. And then if you want to work with existing samples, Let's have a look at this. I've got this pre-made sample, right? So I'm just EBIT ARP is a directory of samples, and then I'm filtering through that and finding the first match, which is 120 BPM, and then the of that, the first which is in C minor. Um, and so I have just an ability to play pre-ordered sounds. If I do a live loop, I can start this going round, right? So now, I know this is eight beats long, so this is going to repeat nicely. Right, so that's good. So now I have an opportunity to start modifying it. Let's add the second one in. Right, and all I'm doing is playing two samples. This is not complicated, right? It might sound nice, but it's just not complicated. I can add some effects over that. Actually, let's go. I can invert. Now it's going to fade up. Well, and all I'm doing is bringing samples in and out. It's nothing complicated. But the nice thing is it's all in time and all works together. I think I'm running out of time now, so I'm going to finish this. There we go. So as you can see, you can just take samples and manipulate them very easily. And this could be any pre-recorded sound from anywhere, including ones you've made yourself. Now, I just want to finish off by saying that, again, this is free, this is open source, it's something you can download tonight. It runs on a Mac, runs on Windows, runs on a Raspberry Pi, so I'm trying to lower the barrier to entry for everybody. I want you to really use this as a tool to start to have conversations with your friends and family who you, you struggle to talk to about programming and get them to understand that programming is also something that they can actually not just get involved with, but find interesting. Right, and talk to your children and your parents and your grandparents and share this around. And try and have and broaden this conversation that, that, that coding is not just a tool for business apps. Right, it is a very important tool for business apps, but it's also a very important tool for humans to express themselves with. And that means you having fun at parties. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam. This You're was welcome. amazing. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I have one. They were stunned for silence. Yes, <laughs> they were stunned. <laughs> Actually, I was thinking, I've been a journalist for 25 years or something, and there are so many parallels between coding and writing as a journalist in the way yeah, we yeah. work and the way we uh, you know, um, relate to our, our the things we do. But you were talking about the kids. What should we do to engage them in coding, other than, you know, bring it into school, but make it easy? Are there other ways? So my, uh, so we need to get them young, yeah. especially girls. So uh, when I go to schools, so the girls are sort of 11 and above, they're already not interested in many yeah. ways. And that's tragic. How come? W that, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Whereas younger, totally excited, totally interested. So getting them young, to give them that first experience and, and to understand that it's actually something for them, and that's not just girls, that's everybody. 
Um, and that's really the important thing. I think it's not about technologies, it's about finding ways to make programming meaningful to children. So that it's something that, that they want to do. Yeah. That, they, that they, they want to then ask the question, well, this is the next thing I want to do. So rather, and rather than having lessons to say, today we are going to make this robot. You say, today we're going to teach you this basic thing, and then you're going to do something with it yourself. Yeah. In the same way, today we're going to learn how to draw a straight line. Now what kind of thing do you want to draw with these straight lines? You make your own pictures. And then make sure that the tool doesn't just allow them to draw straight lines, mm. but allows them to, ask, to start asking questions that are, are meaningful to them. And then as a teacher, you can go around to the individual yeah. and give them a little bit of extra th for them information that's not just for everybody. Because it, we all want to make sure that by the end of the lesson, everyone's work is completely different to everybody else's because everyone's expression is completely different to yeah. everybody else's. Yeah, because in schools today, it tend to be kind of tends to be kind of inboxed, you know, this is now we are programming yep. using Scratch or whatever. Well, so there's so two levels of that, isn't it? There's le the level of boxing on in terms of a subject per subject, which I think is nonsense. Mm. I mean, the fact that maths is separate to music, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, they're very, very similar. Uh, and art is separate from science. That's nuts. Yeah. The hypothesis is an artistic expression. It's a guess. It's an assumption. But the approach you take to use it is, is, is a methodical one, but you can use that methodical approach in art just as much as you can in science. So there's that aspect. And then the other aspect is to make sure that the thing they're doing isn't the same as everyone else. Yeah. Right, you haven't just got, you're making everybody into a factory of mm. which are producing the same output. Mm. That's just, it's just not fair. That's so children. important with children. Yeah. Well, Sam, you are performing tonight yes. at the Mingle. Certainly am. It's yes. 10 past five. Don't miss that. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.